So I, uh, this past weekend, I saw a lot of blood. Uh, most of it wasn't real. I, actually, all of it wasn't real. Um, our new neighbors, John and Robert, made a haunted house in their yard, and, and the streets of, of Fullerton um, are legendary for these extravagant Halloween stagings. Thousands of, of people come descending on our neighborhoods, young and old, and in, in, in these extravagant costumes. And this past weekend, I saw swords coming out of heads. I saw bloodied corpses, dangling skeletons, impaled zombies, headless ghouls, and tombstone after tombstone. I think you get the picture. If I didn't know any better, I'd have thought I was seeing something out of a scene from the book of Judges. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's actually where I'm going today, so it's the end of my transition. Um, yeah. For some reason, preachers avoid the gruesome stories of judges, except for Samson. Samson's this, like, epic superhero in the Christian faith, and so he gets a lot of attention, but... but Ehud doesn't. He's a, the, the southpaw that went into the king's palace and with his sword stabbed the king so deeply that the excrement flew out and the sword got lodged in this overweight king's belly. Judges chapter 3. Or Jael, she had um, taken in an enemy general and when he had fallen asleep, she went up beside him and took a tent peg and hammered it through his temple so deeply that it came out the other side and nailed his head to the ground. That's chapter 4. Or the Levite whose concubine was ruthlessly raped by the tribe of Benjamin. And to make a statement to Israel, he after she died, cut her body up into 12 parts and sent them across to the 12 tribes of Israel as a statement to the nation. One, one writer calls these passages um, texts of terror. And we have Tower of Terror, right? These are texts of terror. And I'm actually going to go to one of these stories today. And though it's rather horrific, it does lack some of that, the, there's no like entrails or like like lots of blood in this story, but it is a very sad story. Maybe a little bit more PG-13 than R. Let me just say that. This is Talbot, by the way. Um, today, um, I'm going to take on a, 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 a... If we're supposed to... I, I mean, we're supposed to preach the whole counsel of God's word. So this is in God's word. It's in the Old Testament, which is three-quarters of the book. So it's, it's appropriate to go there today. Um, but it's a seldom-told Old Testament story about when a good and godly man thought that he needed help for God to do what God had promised all along that he was going to do. So if, if you have a Bible, it would be good to have it open in front of you just so you can kind of follow along um, on your phone. On, we'll have the passage up on the screen, but I'm going to be going around a little bit on it. But it's Judges chapter 11, beginning in verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah, and he crossed Gilead and Manasseh. He passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, then whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it, sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Aroer to Mineth. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. And when Jephthah returned to his home, who should come out to meet him but his daughter? dancing to the sound of timbrels. She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. And after the two months, she returned to her father 
and he did to her as he had vowed. And she was a virgin. And from this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. As bizarre as this story sounds, this is the word of the Lord. And I want to unpack this confusing account of a leader who offered his daughter, his, not just his daughter, this is the like only child, as a burnt offering. And, and what do we learn from this story? Well, the obvious like, lesson is like, don't burn your children. But if that was the only lesson, then we'd be done right now. So there's more to it than that. And that's, I want to, at the outset, I want to like, take three takes on this story um, that over time have become an easy explanation, an easy way out to, to make more palatable this horrific passage. Some readers have spun this story to make it more digestible. One option is Jephthah made a, made a vow before the Lord offering a human sacrifice because he just he didn't know the Lord forbade this. He didn't know that this was against the law. In other words, he, he made it out of ignorance. He just said something and didn't realize that God didn't want him to say that. It's like you know driving down the carpool lane and you get pulled over. and you, oh, I didn't realize it already turned into a carpool lane. That, so that was the ignorance excuse. The ignorance excuse was one way you can take the story. But Leviticus 18, Deuteronomy 12, both I mean, clearly forbids human sacrifice. And you know, per perhaps he made this foolish vow because people were doing what they wanted to do. And if you don't know the law, the law of God, then how do you know that what you're doing is outside of what God's word tells you to do? That's a very reasonable response, but it's wrong, uh, at least for Jephthah. If you read chapter 11 earlier, verses 12 through 28, you'll see that Jephthah was profoundly acquainted with the law. He knew the law inside and out. He knew the Israelite history. He could recite the law, and he did that as he was kind of negotiating with the Ammonites. So ignorance was not Jephthah's mistake. A second incorrect take on this passage is that when it uses the word, whatever comes out, I will sacrifice it, that maybe, maybe he, he thought it was going to be an animal. And maybe it didn't mean it for be, to be a human. He's expecting some kind of an animal sacrifice. Some have interpreted what he said in 1131, that whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet when I turn, I will offer it as a burnt offering. That maybe he meant an animal would greet him. Maybe a sheep. Maybe a dog. Preferably a cat. Uh, uh, maybe Jeff, uh, sorry, cat lovers out there. Just, you know, maybe Jephthah never expected it to be a person. You know, at, at, you know in, in animal sacrifices were appropriate. These things were happening in Old Testament times, so this kind of vow would have made sense. But I mean, maybe his, maybe, maybe his mother-in-law usually greeted him when he came home. I don't know. Whatever it could be. I love my mother-in-law. Like, like, she's not going to podcast this. She's you. Mrs. Wilson, I love you so much. Um, <laughs> but I think... Most scholars, especially Talbot scholars, would agree that it was a person and it was not an animal. And though we'd like to think otherwise, Jephthah knew that should he be victorious, he might be sacrificing a family member. Well, the third misunderstanding some have attributed to the story is that Jephthah, that he never really killed his daughter. He never really offered her as a burnt sacrifice. Instead, some people have looked at verse 38 and said that they, they went to the mountains and they wept for her what? For her virginity. And not for her life, but they wept for her virginity. That Maybe she was banished to the temple for lifelong celibacy and never married, never have children, and that was tantamount to losing your life. Maybe that's what he meant. Maybe he didn't really kill his daughter, but just said, you'll, know, you'll never marry, and you're going to become now one of, the, one of the celibates in the temple. And maybe for a young girl at that age, this was the same as death, living out her days in a convent, and as caring and as loving and as easy to digest this answer is, the truth is that Jephthah voluntarily, as the text says in verse 31, sacrificed his daughter. He did what he vowed to do. 
But then why does the text say that it was her virginity that her friends wept over? Well, I think the point is underscored that like this is his only child. This is his daughter. And, and she's never going to marry, never going to have a family. And I think that adds and emphasizes the grief and the tragedy of this very painful story. So if those are some incorrect assumptions of the story, then what does this heart-wrenching story of Jephthah tell us? How do we make sense of of this if, if Jephthah truly knew God's word? So ignorance was an excuse. Truly knew it could have been a person, it wasn't going to be an animal sacrifice. And truly did what he said he was going to do, not just banishing his daughter to to a life of celibacy, but actually sacrificed his daughter. Why would he do this? Well, let me kind of jump to the end to say, like, what he did was, like, dead wrong in God's eyes. Okay? Jephthah didn't win the battle because his of a vow he made, even though he thought he did, even though maybe his soldiers thought he did, and even his daughter thought that's why he won the battle. Remember what she said in verse 36, my father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do not just, um, uh, do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies. You see, it grieved God's heart that when this leader did something so terrible, killing his only child to fulfill a vow, it was something that he should have never done in the first place. And the laws of God, as I mentioned earlier, they denounce killing in this way, especially offering of human sacrifice. Deuteronomy, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done. They even burn their daughters and sons in the fire. Okay, so if what Jephthah did was an abomination to God, why did he do it? I want to answer this question by maybe eliminating a few of the possibilities. It might be running through your mind right now. Um, Maybe Jephthah did it because he was a pagan. You can know God's word and, and, and still be not a follower. So maybe he did it because he wasn't truly anointed man of God. Maybe as everyone was doing right in their own eyes. And but if you back up with me a little bit, you learn a little bit more about this man. Jephthah came from a really rough background. He was born to a prostitute. His father was a prominent person. His mother was a prostitute. And worse than that, his father and his, and his father's wife had other children. But Jephthah was the son of the prostitute. He was the one that was basically alienated, ostracized from his family. He was the one who had a lot to overcome it would be very difficult to find someone with a less promising background. But in the providence of God, that's often what he does, right? He uses the least promising to fulfill his will. I mean, look at Gideon. Gideon came from the least of the least, also a judge's story. So Jephthah's called by God to lead the Israeli army against the Ammonites. And all of the rest of the chapter, until we get to the point what we just read a few minutes ago, It's all about Jephthah's diplomacy with the enemy, his emerging leadership skills, his trying to negotiate with the Ammonites. But his diplomacy didn't work. You see that in verse 28. It says, the king of the people of Ammon did not heed the words which Jephthah sent him. So it's time for Jephthah to take action. All right, he's going to do his battle thing. And then in verse 29, it says, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him, empowering him for the task of taking on these pagan oppressors. He was filled with the spirit of the Lord. We can't blame his wrongdoing, saying that he was an out-and-out pagan. So that's not the reason. Well, maybe he did this because he made a vow, and God forbids his people to make vows, were vows wrong? You know, was Jephthah's vow a mistake that he made a vow to God? No, vows aren't wrong. They're not wrong in the Old Testament. They're not wrong in the New Testament. They're found throughout Scripture. Deuteronomy 23.10, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it. In other words, you make a vow, you do the vow you make. Numbers 36, Psalm 15, Acts 5, on and on. So the mistake here was not that he made a vow before God. He made the, God, the vow, he meant the vow, and he fulfilled the vow. Believing that God was 
in on this deal with him, especially if the battle was won. When he saw his daughter, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down, and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. Why would Jephthah make a vow like this? Let me speculate with you for our last few minutes on what was at the root of Jephthah's failure. And this is the same problem that can be at the root of our challenges as followers of Christ. Jephthah allowed his zeal for God because of this apparent blessing on his life to get out of control. And he just disconnected from God's word. You know, sometimes we're guilty of like not doing enough. Laziness, not being motivated, you know, the sin of sloth. Jephthah's problem was actually just the opposite of that. He was so eager, so ambitious, so self-determined that he wanted to get ahead of God and help God out. He wanted to help pay for the victory even though he had already committed the battle to the Lord in chapter 11, verse 27. Listen to what he said not long before he made this tragic vow. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. And when he said that, the spirit of the Lord came upon him in verse 29. And in some ways, it's like sealing the outcome that God is in control But in Jephthah's excitement to serve God, he stopped allowing God to be God and began treating God like some contract partner rather than a covenant maker. And there's a world of difference between a contract and a covenant. Contract has these out clauses. It has limited liabilities and is based on distrust. But a covenant is a promise and it's not a deal. A covenant has no out clauses, and we receive it based on trust. It's not a transaction made under a signature. It is a promise by someone's word. And God is the God of the covenant. He is not the God of the contract, as if we have some part in the deal. Did God approve of Jephthah's negotiating his if-then clause of verse 30? If you give the Ammonites into my hands, then I will sacrifice as a burnt offering whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph. No, God doesn't approve of if-then clauses. Then why is it in the Bible? Because it serves as a graphic and tragic reminder of what happens when we think we are acting in a way that God approves, when in fact we are reducing God to act on our terms and not his. And we make God into this good luck charm, this Buddha's belly to be rubbed, and thinking our sacrifices will somehow make him happy. And then he will do what needs to be done. Or somehow like Jephthah, we think that somehow God is gonna delight more in the more painful experiences that we put ourselves through. The more unpleasant the situation we put ourselves through, the more pleasing it will be to God. This is a myth from the pit, and it smells like smoke, as if God is sadistic in how he works. The moment we start doing this, thinking that we can manipulate God with our fleeces or our vows, that's the moment he stops being Lord. Was Jephthah's battle won because of his vow? No. It was won because God intended for it to be won. And God gave Jephthah an assurance that he would be victorious long before the vow was made. Victory on God's terms was promised over and over and over in Judges. And this is true time and time again in the life of God's children. Jephthah knew this. He knew God's word. But he just thought, you know, I got to help God out a little bit in this deal. Because he couldn't trust God enough in the covenantal promise that God had made. Just got to help God out a little bit in doing what God needs to do. 
Let me interject just for a moment that this Jephthah-like personality is not uncommon even in Christian leadership today. You know, you fill in the names. Kind of a rough upbringing provides a strong sense of self-determination. Leadership skills develop over time. A commitment to God is made along the way. Rising into positions of Christian leadership with all of the charisma, charismatas, the gifts that propel one into the public arena. Obviously blessed by God, obviously filled with the spirit of God, highly regarded and then given a tremendous amount of responsibility. Seems uniquely fit to the task. So this natural born leader continues to be driven to do well in the kingdom of God. But gets swept up in all of the momentum and all of the ministry stuff with this incredible pressure to lead that that person begins to fall back on that self-determination that helped them so much early on. And without accountability to help them in, stay in check, they, they let slip their sense of dependence on what God said he was going to do. And the result is this perverted view of God and a gross distortion of the gospel are they filled with the Spirit of God and called to a task? Yes. Are they doing what was on the surface seemingly right? Yes. Are their intentions along the way good? Yes. In that they're very kingdom-centered. Though the lines between kingdom work and personal recognition begin to blur. And things to begin to unravel in our lives when we believe that we can work harder or smarter to motivate God or that we can sacrifice more to help God along the way or run ahead of God and making sure that God's purposes are fulfilled. In trying to give God some prompting, Jephthah squeezes God into the margins of his life and the results are tragic. When our gifts outpace our character, the path is dangerous. When your gifts outpace your character, the path is tragic. And as people of God, we have to guard ourselves or the very same thing that happened to Jephthah and countless others can begin in our own lives. Judges 11 is a story about the zeal of God gone bad. This doesn't mean that we deny God a place but this happens when his sovereignty does not become the central place. Because deep down we imagine that God needs a hand. That he needs a deal, he needs a fleece, he needs a vow, he needs a hasty promise from us. And then we become like Jephthah vowing when we should be bowing. Dealing with God when we should be kneeling before God. So many of us are still deal making with God in our own lives. With these if then arrangements. God, if you do this, then I promise I will sacrifice that. Does God approve of sacrifice? Of course he approves of sacrifice. But our sacrifices are responses of gratitude and obedience. They're not part of the deal that we make with him. To obey is better than sacrifice, David writes in Psalm 51, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. In spite of the natural gifts and experiences that Jephthah had, we need to understand and realize that God's divine enabling was behind this great victory over Ammon, recorded in verse 33. It wasn't a deal, it wasn't a vow, it wasn't some pressure Jephthah put on God that won him the victory. It was the fact that the battle belongs to the Lord. Your battle belongs to the Lord. It's not something that you're going to share, that you have part in the victory because soon as you take a share in the victory that comes your way, that's the moment that Christ stops becoming your Lord. It wasn't a deal, it wasn't a vow, it wasn't some pressure that Jephthah put on God that won him the victory, it was a fact that God alone needs to stand as the victor. And that victory podium should not, cannot, will not be shared with anybody else. What does God say in Zechariah? It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit that the victory is yours. 
I love the way Phil Yancey puts it. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you less. God loves you so much. He knows your battles. He knows your struggles. God's not looking for you to help him out. He's looking for you to trust in him. And he wants you to live in his covenant, not be part of some kind of contract. A covenant that promises you that his ways are higher than your ways. And his thoughts are greater than your thoughts. In this is love, 1 John says. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. God is not loving you based on your performance. If he was, he wouldn't have called his love unconditional. Don't uh, add conditions on God's unconditional love. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.